Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga series, the book that changed my life. We are on the fifth episode, the second chapter, The Three Steps of Nature. We have covered in the last episode of this chapter the way to synthesize various yogic schools. So we need to go beyond the various details of outer processes, what is utilized by various schools in their action, in their transformative work. Going beyond the outer details, look into the underlying principle, the underlying core essential idea and the radical force. And it is that idea and its radical force that gives rise to its specific set of processes and the utilities that will come out of it. So when we look at all different schools of yoga, beyond their details into the essential force, essential idea, then we will be able to identify the one common idea and one common force from which all of them derived their specific branches and utilities. When we identify that core, then we will be in a position to synthesize all of them because they will be all naturally falling in place and uniting. And he also touched upon the three steps of nature because yoga itself is evolving and is part of nature's evolutionary process. And there are three steps that we need to be aware of. One is what has already been established. Second is what is ongoing, conscious evolution. Third is what is yet to be evolved. However, this third step has already been demonstrated as isolated prototypes. And some of them reached very high level of possibility demonstrating what is possible. Now let's continue from here. I would highly encourage you to keep the book with you, the text with you. I will be sharing the link in the description of the current chapter. So you can follow the text that I will be reading through so that we can travel together and enjoy the text. So let's begin. That which nature has evolved for us. That which nature has evolved for us. It is nature that is evolving various capacities for us. That which nature has evolved for us and has firmly founded is the bodily life. We have this incredibly resilient, adaptable, living body. And life on earth has diversified into many types of life forms and living bodies of different species. They are very well established from plant kingdom to animal kingdom. This whole spectrum of diversity has stabilized stage of evolution. This is the past evolution of millions of years already established on earth. And we are part of that established stability. That which nature has evolved for us and has firmly founded is the bodily life. Our bodily life is stable. It is well established part of evolution. So that is the first step. She has effected a certain combination and harmony of the two inferior but most fundamentally necessary elements of our action and progress upon earth. So in this firmly founded stability, she has brought together two inferior but most fundamentally necessary elements 
of our action and progress upon earth. So this is about earthly life. Here, two things matters. One is matter, which however, too ethereally spiritual may despise it. Very important statement here. Matter. Our bodily life is happening, unfolding in the material frame, in the material substance. And there is a tendency in some of the yogic schools and approaches to despise matter, the material body itself. Too ethereally spiritual may despise it. Matter, which, however, the too ethereally ethereally spiritual may despise it is our foundation and the first condition of our energies and realizations. It is on the material foundation all our energies. It is the very first condition where all our energies and realizations are to be brought out, to be established. Matter is the foundation and you cannot deny that. Matter, which is however the two ethereally spiritual may despise it, is our foundation and the first condition of our energies and our action. Our energies and our realizations. And the life energy, which is our means of existence in a material body and the basis there even of our mental and spiritual activities. So there are two things. Both he is referring to as the inferior instruments. One is matter, other is the life energy. Now, life energy is something that is yet to be understood by modern science. We have biology, but biology is still tracing its roots into chemistry and physics. And modern science is built on physics and chemistry. And in yoga, we look at life energy, also referred to as prana. Matter and life energy, these are two inferior instruments. And life energy is what animates everything. Life energy, which is our means of existence in a material body. And the basis there, even of our mental and spiritual activities. In this material body, even for our mental activities or even spiritual activities, this life energy is necessary condition. So these are two foundational elements, matter and life energy. And evolution has already established harmony between these two. Therefore, we have a living body. So that is that which nature has evolved for us and has firmly founded is the bodily life, bodily life, material frame in which life is unfolding. She has effected a certain combination of harmony, certain combination of harmony of the two inferior but most fundamentally necessary elements of our action and progress upon earth. Matter is our foundation and the first condition of all our energies and realizations. And life energy, the life energy which is our means of existence in the, in the material body and the basis they are even of our mental and spiritual activities. So when we don't have sufficient life force in us, sufficient vitality in us, sufficient prana shakti in us, even our mind becomes dull and incapable of action. So we can see practices like pranayama is to energize that life energy in the material frame. Because that becomes the very foundation, a healthy body, an opulent, an abundance of vital energy, the life force, the life energy, prana flowing through it. This is the condition in which mind can actually develop.
and even spiritual activities can develop. However, these were inferior instruments in the sense they have been already established and these frameworks are laid out as a condition in which the higher faculty of mind can be brought up. And too ethereally spiritual may despise these two foundations, the tendency to look at the body as an obstacle or as a problem. That is really not the approach of integral perspective. She has, she, nature, has successfully achieved a certain stability of her constant material movement which is at once sufficiently steady and durable and sufficiently pliable and mutable to provide a fit dwelling place and instrument for the progressively manifesting God in humanity. So as far as the work of the past evolution is concerned, she has successfully achieved certain stability of her constant material movement. Stability of her constant material movement. Material nature, everything is moving constantly. Even at a atomic level, science reveals that it is a whirling movement of energy and particles. There is a continuous movement, even at a human level, at earthly level, everything is moving all the time. There is a constant material movement, which is at once sufficiently steady and durable. See, a human body, even though at a deep level, it is constantly in movement at a molecular, atomic, chemical, all these levels, there is a constant movement, but there is a sufficient steadiness and durability. Our body, a healthy body, can comfortably last for 100 years. And at the same time, sufficiently pliable and mutable. Because for learning and evolution to take place, this material base must be pliable and mutable so that it can grow, it can adapt, it can develop new capacities. And nature has already established such a durable, steady, pliable, mutable material envelope, material framework, a living body that is capable of learning, adapting, flexible, mutable. At the same time, steady, stable. So she has successfully achieved a certain stability of her constant material movement, which is at once sufficiently steady and durable and sufficiently pliable and mutable to provide a fit dwelling place, an instrument for the progressively manifesting God in humanity. There is a progressive manifestation of God or the divine possibility in humanity. And she has already well established this living bodily framework, which is flexible, mutable, stable, and durable. This is what is meant by the fable in the Aitareya Upanishad. Aitareya Upanishad is one of the early classic Upanishads which tells us that the gods rejected the animal forms. The gods rejected the animal forms. In the ancient form of conveying profound knowledge, it is given in the form of stories where gods rejected the animal forms, successively offered to them by the divine self. Divine self is involved in this evolutionary process and that divine wisdom is minutely selecting things and nature through nature, work of evolution is unfolding and developing successive life forms, 
and animals' forms were created for the gods to come and dwell. The so gods here in the yogic tradition is to be understood as conscious forces of nature. There is a wide variety of forces of nature, even though it is single force out of which all the forces have emerged. This emerged conscious forces have specializations and functions, functional specializations, and they are referred to as gods. And in the evolution, for example, if the mind is to be established in a living body, the body has to be a fit instrument capable of expressing. So the conscious force, the divine force behind the mind, if it is to manifest in a living mold, it needs the right type of body. So Upanishad is telling, the gods rejected the animal form successively offered to them by the divine self, and only when man was produced, cried out, this indeed is perfectly made and consented to entering. It's an ancient storytelling method of describing the conscious force behind the mind, the divine self of mind, that which consented to enter when the mold of life in the human form emerged. It was fit instrument because it is capable of expressing the mind. And it will be interesting to look at the way the modern evolutionary theories look at mind as an emergence from the conditions of material operations of the brain. Whereas a yogic perspective is giving something else. Mind already exists and as a conscious force, there's a mental force, the life force, the material force, and the mental force and the conscious being, the gods behind it, they consented to enter the living mold. When gods rejected the animal form successively offered to them by the divine self, and only when the man was produced, cried out, this indeed is perfectly made. Man is a mental being. And that mental being to manifest, you need the right mold, right living framework. And animal bodies were not capable of expressing the higher possibilities of the mind. So only when the human body began to emerge, the mind consented to enter. Gods consented to enter. The faculty of mind consented to enter into it. So this is what is meant by the fable in the Aitari Upanishad, which tells us that the gods rejected the animal forms successively offered to them by the divine self, and only when man was produced, cried out, this indeed is perfectly made, and consented to enter in. So prior to that is that previous paragraph, it will be good to read pre previous line. She has successfully achieved a certain stability of her constant material movement, which is at once sufficiently steady and stable and sufficiently pliable and mutable to provide a fit dwelling place, an instrument for the progressively manifesting God in humanity. So, for higher consciousness to manifest, this mold of living body itself has to evolve. And the human body is the fit vehicle in which mind has found its expression, conscious force behind the mind, settled in for, and started expressing itself. She has effected also a working compromise between the inertia of matter and the active life that lives in and feeds on it. That lives in and feeds on it. Life and matter. If we look at matter, pure matter, before life emerged, it is inert. Pure inertia. It cannot move by itself. A rock, clay, soil. 
it's inert. But nature has effected a working compromise between these two opposing principles. Life is active. It moves constantly. Whereas matter is inert. It wants to be stable, like a stone sitting in one place. Whereas life, energy, like an animal, moves its animate matter. So life that lives in it and feeds on it. Life lives in matter, in a material frame, lives in it as well as feeds on it. Life, energy in the body eats other material forms. We humans eat plants or other animals. Same way, animals also eat plants and animals. Some animals eat animals. There is feeding of matter. So life energy feeds on matter. It lives in a material frame, or at the same time, it eats other material frames, material molds. So she has effected also a working compromise between inertia of matter and the active life that lives in and feeds on it by which not only is vital existence sustained, but the fullest developments of the mentality are rendered possible. So the mental life itself became possible only under these conditions, when life started living in matter and feeding on matter and established a working compromise between inertia of matter and the activity of life. Energy moves all the time. It's dynamic, whereas matter is stable, immobile. And mobility, movement and stability is brought together. At the same time, made the body more supple, pliable, mutable, flexible, into which the mind could enter. So it has taken millions of years of evolution for life on earth to find this right balance. Evolution in nature established this firmly and it is upon this the mentality is made possible. The fullest development of mentality are rendered possible within this framework. So we need to really honor what evolution has already established as a stable foundation, the living material body, where inertia of matter and dynamism of life are brought to a working compromise. Even though we need to sleep and rest like stone, then we wake up and get into action. There is a working compromise between this inertia of matter and the activity of life. So this is an already established thing. A healthy living body is an established stability in nature, established step in nature. This equilibrium constitutes the basic status of nature in man. This equilibrium of the living body constitutes the basic status of nature in man and is termed in the language of yoga this his gross body composed of the material or food sheath and the nervous system or vital vehicle anna kosha or prana kosha so this gross body is made of two layers. There is prana in it, there is gross matter in it. In the ancient vocabulary, matter, the physical material body is also referred to as annam, food. It is made of food. It is by eating food, it is built and it sustains itself with food and it itself become food for other living beings. This equilibrium constitutes, constitutes the basic status of nature in man and is termed in the language of yoga, his gross body, sthula sharira. Sthula sharira is composed of annamaya kosha and pranamaya kosha. 
the gross body composed of the material or food sheath and the nervous system or the vital vehicle. So there is a nervous system running through the physical frame, animating it, making it living. Every cell is being fed with life energy, keeping it alive. A living, responsive, delicate nervous system. So that is the contribution of the prana into the body, the prana kosha. So the gross body composed of material and food or food sheath and the nervous system or the vital vehicle. That's another vocabulary, vital vehicle, prana kosha, which provides the nervous system of our bodily existence. And these are already established, well-stabilized, established steps of nature. If then this inferior equilibrium is the basis and first means of the higher movements. Here, higher movements, mind is already treated as a higher development. Material living body is treated as that foundational layer composed of two layers, which is treated as, considered as inferior. If then this inferior equilibrium, because it's also a compromise between the inertia of matter and the need of life to be the dynamic action of life, it's still an inferior equilibrium, is the basis and the first means of a higher movements, which the universal power contemplates. Universal power here is the power of power of nature or behind it, the divine power, universal power contemplates. And if it constitutes the vehicle in which the divine here seeks to reveal itself, it's interesting. He's using the word contemplates. So the power that is presiding over the evolution in nature, since yoga looks at it as conscious force, and we are also referring to it as that which is contemplating. If the universal power contemplates and if it constitutes the vehicle in which the divine here seeks to reveal itself, divine is seeking to reveal itself in the mold. If the Indian saying is true that the body is the instrument provided for the fulfillment of the right law of our nature. Body is the instrument. We don't necessarily feel our body as the instrument. We can look at a pen as a tool, even a car as a tool. But our body, we identify so much with the body. I am the body. We don't feel ourselves as anything separate from the body, I am this body. But from the yogic point of view, which we can also develop consciously, cultivate, body is the instrument provided for the fulfillment of the right law of our nature. There is a right law of our nature. Then any final recoil from the physical life must be a turning away from the completeness of the divine wisdom. So if the bodily life is provided as the foundation, even if it is a working compromise, any turning away from it is a recoil. It's not, it cannot be the right thing to do then any final recoil from the physical life must be a turning away from the completeness of the divine wisdom. If we reject this bodily life, it will be essentially a turning away from the completeness of the divine wisdom. Because divine wisdom has already established this and there must be a purpose. And the renunciation of its aim in earthly manifestation so then any final recoil from the physical life must be a turning away from the completeness of the divine wisdom and a renunciation of its aim in earthly manifestation. So 
we cannot recoil and reject bodily life because there is a divine wisdom and its completeness for which this is required. So we cannot, when we recoil from it, we are also rejecting the aim of earthly manifestation. Such a refusal may be owing to some secret law of their development. The right attitude for certain individuals, but never the aim intended for mankind. For some individuals, owing to some secret law of their development. Remember, nature is working behind all humanity and she may pick up an individual for certain specific function, specific purpose, to push things certain beyond certain limits or to break through beyond certain limits. She may choose to put somebody into an isolation and going beyond this bodily frame. But that cannot be the aim intended for mankind. It can be for certain individuals if nature has chosen it to be so. Such a refusal may be owing to some secret law of their development, the right attitude for certain individuals, but never the aim intended for mankind. So when we propagate the idea of renunciation of bodily life, we are missing the point. That whole divine purpose in earthly manifestation is also rejected along with such renunciation, such a rejection of bodily life. It can be therefore no integral yoga which ignores the body. Let me repeat this again. It cannot be, you know, it can be therefore no integral yoga which ignores the body or makes it annulment, makes its annulment or its rejection indispensable to a perfect spirituality. Annulment and rejection of the body. When that becomes the condition, indispensable condition for spiritual perfection, that cannot be integral yoga. It's very straightforward here. It can be therefore no integral yoga which ignores the body or makes its annulment or its rejection indispensable to a perfect spirituality. That will be a wrong turn. Rather, the perfecting of the body, the perfecting of the body also should be the last triumph of the spirit. The last triumph. It's not the first triumph. It is the last triumph of the spirit. And to make the bodily life also divine, must be God's final seal upon his work in the universe. So the whole creation, the material creation has a purpose. Divinization of the body is also part of the master plan of the divine. It is the triumph of the spirit in matter instead of rejecting and escaping from the material envelope, it is to embrace this material envelope and divinize it. The perfecting of the body also should be the last triumph of the spirit. It is last triumph because prior to it, there is a perfection of the mind itself, perfection of our life energy, the vitality, the prana shakti, the whole nervous system, all that then the last stage is the perfection of the body. There's the divinization of the mind, divinization of the prana, the life force, then last divinization of the body. The perfecting of the body also should be the last triumph of the spirit and to make the bodily life also divine must be God's final seal 
upon his work in the universe. There is divine's work unfolding in the universe through nature and that divine wisdom is minutely selecting its steps and slowly building things up. And through nature, that evolutionary process is unfolding and we are moving towards that final perfection in even the perfection of the body. The obstacle which the physical presents to the spiritual. The obstacle which the physical presence to the spiritual is no argument for the rejection of the physical. The physical body brings with it its inertia, its lethargy, its sleep, its dullness, its incapacity to progress, its aging, its decay, its disease, its death. All these are happening to the physical body. Body brings with it all its limitations. That's why it's also referred to as an inferior instrument. It is still in this evolutionary process. Remember, mind itself could manifest only when the living body reached certain level of evolution and human body emerged. It is then the mind made it possible to manifest itself. The obstacle which the physical presents to the spiritual, if the spiritual is to express itself in the bodily life, there are all these obstacles of the physical, starting with its inertia, its incapacity, its dullness. It's no argument for the rejection of the physical. We cannot present the inability of the body to progress along with the spiritual progress as an argument for its rejection. For in the unseen providence of things, our greatest difficulties are our best opportunities. This is fascinating. Our greatest difficulties are our best opportunities in the unseen providence of things. We may not be able to see it, but from a greater perspective, our greatest difficulties are our best opportunities. So, body itself potentially could be our greatest ally in yoga. So, we must consider that possibility here. Our greatest difficulties are our best opportunities. A supreme difficulty is nature's indication to us of a supreme conquest to be won and an ultimate problem to be solved. So there is an indication of a supreme conquest to be won. There is a work to be done an ultimate problem to be solved. And that's why we have taken birth here in this material envelope, in this material earth. There is a project earth that is unfolding, divinization of the matter itself unfolding, and bodily life itself is still a stage in evolution. Mind has manifested, but there are greater potentials ready, waiting to be manifested. A supreme difficulty is nature's indication to us of a supreme conquest to be won and an ultimate problem to be solved. That's exciting. Anyone who is excited by the challenges, problem solving, and that's what is make us human. We are not here to be in the comfort zone. We are ready to take on the adventure of solving the complex problems the ultimate problem to be solved. It is not a warning of an inextricable snare to be shunned. Many yogic traditions consider the bodily life as a snare, a trap, to be shunned, to be rejected, to be thrown aside. It is not a warning of an inextricable snare to be shunned or of an enemy too strong for us from whom we must flee. That's another way many traditions would look at 
the body as the enemy from where we must flee, the attraction of the body with the body, all that temptations of the body from which we must escape and run. So it is not a warning of an inextricable snare to be shunned or an enemy too strong for us from whom we must flee. So there is a reason why this bodily instrument, living body is there. We have to figure that out. Divinization of this is a last triumph and it's a great challenge. But that difficulty is not the reason for rejecting it. So when we come up with a philosophy that says that earthly existence is an illusion and we are trapped in it and the liberation from this worldly material existence into the pure spirit is the very purpose of life. Ending the cycle of rebirth is the very purpose of life. We are missing this point. The divine wisdom created this material universe, this material earth and unfolding evolution here. It is a work in progress. Project Earth is still a work half done. So we cannot flee from here. An integral yoga need to look at the totality and look at all these possibilities and embrace it wholeheartedly. With that, we come to the end of fifth episode. See you next week and uh, please do share your feedback, your suggestions for improvement and uh, subscribe to the channel so that every Wednesday 6 a.m. you get the notification of the new episode. See you next week. Thank you.